Welcome back to another episode of Ask a Nerd, where we get under the skin of zero emissions technologies. Today, we're getting under a luxurious carbon fiber A-surface skin to find out more about electric drive units and how simplifying systems and adding lightness can really pay off. I'm Tom Brimble from Green Plates, and here's Cecile Perra from Oravel. Hello. So I don't know you, but uh, each time I try to understand and compare the difference electric motor and electric drive unit of different car manufacturer, I think it's very complicated because I do not always understand what choice I've made and why they are doing different things from one another. So I think it's time to ask a nerd. And today we have a specific guest. Um, so before I present uh, Matt, our guest, I would like to explain you how it is organized today. So we have um, 30, 45 minutes of talk with some educational part, understanding how an electric drive unit works, what are the functions. Then we will compare and discuss a different uh, EDU architecture. So the Audi e-tron, the Tesla Model 3 and the Porsche Taycan. Then we will, of course, deep dive into uh, the Lotus Evija, and we will ask some questions about EV trend and what impact it has on electric machine. Meanwhile, you can ask anything, make comment or ask questions uh, in the comment below. Tom will gather all of this and will join for the last part to ask the question to our guest. And today, our guest is Matt Bloomfield from uh, Lotus. Hi, Matt. Can you nice present you. yourself, please? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Excellent. So, uh, hello everybody and thank, thank you for having me on here, Cecile. Um, I, so, I work at Lotus and Chief Engineer for Research and Concepts, which basically means I'm looking after everything on the, the left-hand side of, of a, a systems engineering V. So, where do we want to go in the future? Um, what, what information and knowledge do we need to generate and, and how do we go about doing it? And, Mm. Um, specifically around electric drive units and the, the reason for interest to, in this area for me. Um, if we just compare what what can be achieved with an electric drive unit compared to a more traditional powertrain in terms of delivering delivering power, they're fantastically capable things and that there's a wealth of uh, interesting engineering activities around them. And for the audience, can you explain how you end up to be in electric vehicle? Mm. Yeah, so um, this my, my introduction to electric vehicles uh, came via hybrids. So back at uh, Jaguar Land Rover, I was project leader for full hybrid Range Rover, and the the opportunities of the EV technologies were, were just fantastic. Um, there, there was a lot of engineering challenges around uh, developing them, integrating them, and, and developing the the supply chain. So it's it's uh, it evolved out of hybrids into full electric vehicles for me. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Matt. So. Today, we start with some uh, learning as usual for us. So we know an electric uh, drive unit is made of three main things. So we have uh, the electric machine, so the e-motor, of course. We have the inverter and we have also a transmission. And of course, the objective is to convert electric energy into drive torque. But we see that uh, there are really basic things that get already a very huge impact. Can you, for example, explain to people why when you change, uh, for example, the voltage, you will end up with different behavior, for example? Yeah, sure. So uh, if you look at the um, graph in the, the middle of the screen, you can see uh, the, the motor will be able to deliver torque at different speeds relative to the input voltage of the, uh, of the DC link. Um, th this is really an artifact of the physical makeup of the electric machine. So uh, you, you've, you've basically got a set of coils that you, that you excite and then you've got a rotor for a permanent magnet machine. Um, and as, as that rotor starts to move, it will generate a, 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 an opposing electrical field. And if we've got more uh, voltage to overcome that field, we can generate the same phase currents and torque for longer. So uh, as you change the DC link voltage, you change the capability of a given electric motor architecture to deliver torque. Um, okay, thanks. So we have also a lot of other function, of course, uh, to ensure and just not to transfer electric energy toward torque. 
Um, so here you have um, a color code that explains different functions that we have. The inverter, of course, need to make a conversion of DCAC, ACDC. We, of course, need to be sure that we do not have any interference because of a magnetic electromagnetic field we can create. So we may have to isolate and make sure we do not have uh, interference. Of course, the electric motor needs to generate the torque and the transmission can or not use different uh, speeds. We will see that later in the different architecture. Something very important, it's also about uh, the fact that we generate a lot of heat because we have a lot of power here, so we need to dissipate the heat. This heat will have two effects, so we need to get the thermal management because we need to cool down the things, but also because we have a lot of moving part together that make somewhere we may have some lubrification problems. So we are you can see here that there are a lot of functions. You gently provide us what you call the ballpark good number of something like that. I think some of these elements are easy to understand. So we understand easily that the electric machine need to get the highest power for the lowest mass. So that I think is obvious. But can you also explain what can be some feature of the inverter? How you qualify something good here? Yeah, so uh, there's a few numbers I've provided there that, that just that I just keep in my head for, for, for evaluating different different solutions. So for, first of all, it's, it's how, how big is it going to be? So uh, phase, phase current per kilo, so about, about, about 70 amps per kilo uh, would qualify a, a, an inverter as a, as a quick assessment of something interesting. Uh, and then 15 to 20 uh, nano henrys per leg. So this is, if you refer back to the previous slide, you've got uh, an architecture diagram of the switches. Uh, so for an individual phase leg, um, this is the parasitic inductance of the link cap, the conductors, the um, put the, the, the construction of the. Uh, of the three, three phase. This is what you mean, right? Yes. So we'll have three three phase legs uh, with two switches per leg, and, and um, we we want to be able to accurately control the voltage with that phase leg and the switching devices. So we don't want parasitic inductance. Mm -hmm. um, and and if if someone can show me that they understand their parasitic inductance, it's a, it's a good indicator that they've um, been through with their supply chain, with their physical and electrical layout, and and fifteen to twenty for a. Uh, inverter of a decent size around 500 amps is, is, a, is, a, is a pretty good indicator. Um, then in terms of switching speed, we, we, we avoid parts of the uh, operating window of the switches that um, generate heat and to do that we switch them as fast as we can but, but not so fast that we um, generate lots of stray currents or overshoot. Uh, so about 10, 10 kilovolts per microsecond is a, a ballpark number for, for switching speed and then in terms of the semiconductors themselves um, clearly there's lots of people uh, are trying to innovate in this area with lots of different products um, but about 10 milli ohms for a 250 amp capable switch device is, is roughly where we'd be looking for an inverter okay so now we talk about different architectures that you are going to help us to understand Matt so this is uh, the Audi e-tron uh, we can I'm going to say, of course, recognize where are the inverter, motor, and transmission. Um, can you help people to give some insight about this architecture? What do you find specific? What do you find maybe good or bad? And can you explain a little bit more about that, please? Okay, so yeah, we, we've been through that. Uh, there's a number of different functions that the the, the uh, EDU has to provide, and there's quite a range of, of different ways of putting together a, a, a product that deliver those those functions. So the, the Audi one, uh, this particular one, uh, they put a lot of effort into the cooling system. Um, the, the good cooling helps us to deliver more performance for longer because yeah. you can see on the graph you've got uh, initial peak performance, uh, and then you've got a thermally limited continuous performance and in some situations this can be as low as 40 percent of the peak and if we've got a particularly badly thermally managed drive unit we can find we're having uh, additional mass of drive unit hauled around to enable the uh, continuous or consistent performance so uh, paying attention to cooling to uh, reduce the overall weight of the system and enable more delivery of performance to the customers is something really important to us. Obviously, we can see the peak is higher than the continuous one. Can you 
give some clue. I mean, why we cannot keep the peak longer? Is that because we discharge everything, or can you explain something about this? Uh, so, e e even on a, even on a test bed, when we've got a um, continuous supply, we, we can't maintain the continuous power. So, so this this would be around um, for for this particular machine, uh, rotor temperature. So we've got a, a cage in the, in the rotor that that is uh, has an induced current in it, uh, and induced currents will have losses. They will get hot, and they will have a, a thermal limit. So, we, we need to. Make sure we're maintaining that rotor temperature and for permanent magnet machines it's effectively the same thing only we'll have a risk of demagnetization okay so of course mm. we have to talk about tesla so tesla model 3 same here we can see we have the inverter transmission and motor we can obviously see that uh, the geometry the way it's dispatched is very different um, can you also explain some of the difference here? I know that uh, one of the main things is about the inverter. Uh, maybe you can talk more in detail about that. Yeah, sure. So th there's a couple of things that I, I really like about this drive unit. The first thing is it, they've, they've put a lot of effort into um, making it efficient in terms of uh, power performance delivery for a kilo of mass, so 2.6 kilowatts per kilo. In, in terms of mass production uh, driving units, it's, it's pretty effective and it, it's a, a good example to our engineering teams here of, of what can be achieved uh, through, through some core principles such as um, functional integration. Um, then the, the next really interesting thing about this was it's first to market with a silicon carbide derived inverter. Now, silicon carbide um, is a material used to construct, used in the construction of the electrical switching that allows us to control the voltage and waveform that goes into the motor. Um, th this would be moving over from sili a silicon based solution relative to silicon. Silicon carbide gives us uh, a number of items that you can see listed on the screen. So th these are all. Oh, we never see this in engineering. They're, they're synergistic benefits that all work together to, to work better overall. So uh, the breakdown voltage is the first one, which... which Can you explain what is the breakdown voltage, maybe, for people if they are not familiar with uh, lower... So it's, a, it's effectively the ability of the conducting material to uh, resist a voltage. Um, so it, it, if you do get voltage breakdown, it becomes conductive when you perhaps don't want it to. Um, so if you've got a higher breakdown voltage, Voltage, you can have less material to resist the same voltage and if you've got less material to switch through in the on state uh, you can achieve a lower resistance so we're generating less heat from from the same uh, area of, of semiconductor device um, then we've got higher van gap so we can we, whilst we're generating less heat we can also tolerate more heat so again more capable and working together well um, and then the thermal conductivity of the junction itself we, we can pull more heat out of it so we can better control um, thermally what's going on at that junction and have um, well, if we've got lower thermal resistance we've got a better idea between uh, a temperature sensor and, and the junction temperature so we, we're being able to control it with more confidence um, and, and then uh, again we talked about switching on faster so if we've got um, improved electron saturation velocity we can turn the switch on faster and reduce our losses so uh, over, overall there's a, there's a number of benefits of this, this material as a switching device that help us to make a smaller um, more thermally efficient inverter um, anything you want to add on uh, the tesla one what sort of cooling is it, this one, if we compare to the Audi one? So the Tesla one uses some discrete devices, the ST-Pack. Uh, they're bonded to, they're sintered, sorry, to a, I, I, I don't actually know the d details of the of the cooling channel. I imagine it's a pin fin with a, with a sintered connection to, to pull the heat out of it. Okay, no problem. So the last one we would like to talk a little bit about is uh, the Porsche Taycan. Uh, obviously, it is known because it is one of the rare electric vehicles that get two gear. And usually now we have no gear, I mean one gear. Um, can you explain a little bit about this, what advantage it has and what do you, why uh, Porsche has done that? And do you believe it's going to be something we will see more often from the more high performance car? So there's two two reasons really for, for uh, putting multiple ratios in. There's there's uh, flexibility over 
uh, operating point. So when you're uh, driving and delivering torque, uh, you, you can operate at different speed ranges and different torque demands. Uh, so that can give you some freedom to move your operating point around efficiency map and achieve, and achieve a uh, higher overall thermal efficiency. Uh, and then the second is to provide flexibility over torque delivery. So uh, the, the, this particular rear axle is massively capable in terms of torque delivery. 12,000 newton meters of axle ax torque is is huge and, and if you were looking to do that with a single speed you'd be restricted in your uh, maximum speed that you could achieve with the vehicle so uh, in, in this particular case we've got a uh, reasonably high speed capability as well as uh, very large uh, torque capability and then a lower ratio to enable more efficient operation uh, by as you can see on the bottom left moving your uh, low points up into the efficiency higher efficiency areas and uh, away from that efficiency cliff that you can see in the bottom of that graph where uh, the overall system efficiency uh, drops away rapidly at the low loads that you would see on a uh, emissions or daily driving cycle with uh, with a high uh, reduction ratio. Okay, so now we we'll talk about uh, the Lotus Evija, which of course you know very well. So it is said that it is one of the most powerful uh, series production cars. Are you? Are you? How you compare, for example, for Rimac uh, Nevera? Where are you? And mm -hmm. can you tell us about uh, what is used in the Evija? So. So we, we like to say it's the most powerful production car and we, and we hope when we get to production it will still be there but I think we're talking 20 or 30 horsepower in 2000 so it's, it's pretty similar in terms of delivered performance to the uh, Rimac Nevera. Um, I think if we look at uh, drive unit torque it's, it, or uh, power density it, it's a little bit of a different story so I think they're about 6.3 and we're uh, 8.3 kilowatts per kilo so um, we, we, we've, we've, got, we've done a pretty good job in, in delivering a lot of performance from uh, limited weight and volume on the drive units on this particular one. And uh, of course Lotus is very well known for light weightening so I can see the car is relatively light I would say for an electric uh, vehicle because it's under two tons so obviously you make a good job for light weightening. But it's not only the electric motor, of course, it's also the chassis and a lot of other things. And, and the battery. The ba so I, I can't see another product getting more power out of the battery for a very long time than, than this particular one. So we need to uh, make another video to talk about your battery, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> one day, yeah. Uh, so yeah, this, this battery is, is very much prioritised for availability of power. Uh, so we, we will have a mass penalty there. but. So you have prepared for us different information about uh, the Evija uh, EDU. Can you give us uh, some understanding and what define your uh, electric motor? Yeah, so for, for, for the EDU, we, um, well, there, there were two things really. It was how do we uh, deliver the most powerful production car because that, that's that's one of the, the key things we want because th this is a halo car for us it's it's um, highlighting a massive turning point for Lotus and the entry to EV so it's it's uh, generating excitement demonstrating technology so the, the, the most powerful was um, a significant thing for us uh, so that gives us a power target and, and then there's the um, realization of some of the benefits of, of uh, EV driving units so making them as small as possible so that we could focus on delivering aerodynamic benefits to the drivers and the overall performance of the vehicle or um, package volume for more capable suspension systems or package volume for that battery so that we can deliver the power. I like the fact you took the picture yeah. with a can so we can really see that it's super compact. Uh, I mean I have seen it uh... In a show, I have seen it for real, but that's super small and really packed. Like you could put that just in a sport bag. Yeah, absolutely. Is yeah, it, it is very small, and I, I I love coming into the office to see it because it, it's a reminder of just staring on the screen is one thing, and we can see it next to the coat can. Yeah, it's quite small, but physically seeing it in person and thinking it's a thousand horsepower and five thousand four hundred newton meters, it, it's it's really quite impressive to see in person. Oh. 
I also know you develop, if I'm correct, uh, the electric motor and the inverter are developed by uh, integral powertrain and uh, the transmission by mm -hmm. XR, if I'm correct. What is the role of Lotus to making working that together? Because I understand that it's not because you take very powerful one that if you pack all together, they work well. So I, I imagine you have some calibration or other things to do here or... Oh, yeah, so there's there's calibration activities. There's functional safety design and integration with the with the wider vehicle. One of one of the questions that people love to ask is, oh, how do you deal with the functional safety challenges of four independent motors and um, with, with that cross linking and, and, and torque vectoring? Um, so that that was that was uh, part of our, our challenge in in this particular situation. And and then there's um, uh, uh, oversight of the integration activity into the vehicle and and the uh, and the different subsystems together. So there's, there's quite a lot that, that Lotus brought to the party in this particular situation. So you have also different um, particularities. So I know that we talk about uh, the materials that can be used. We can talk about. Uh, some of uh, the choices you have made for the uh, electric motor, or you also can focus on the efficiency. So can you tell us a little bit more about that in the EVGA? Yeah, certainly. So we, we work from left to right on the screen. Um, it, on the previous slide, you, you probably noticed that it, the overall length for all six components is 650 millimeters. So it, it is very tight and we had to, we had to look at ways of, of making the um, mainly the motor in this in this situation smaller because uh, the, the inverter you got a standard set of, of parts that we, we're not going to address too much uh, within a package envelope then we've got the transmission that needs a certain axial length to transmit that torque uh, so we, we really focused on what opportunities were available within the motor so the the first thing is in, in most uh, production high volume drive units and electric machines you'll find um, a silicon electrical iron um, which is is the magnetic field carrying material to, to, to generate that magnetic interface between the rotor and the stator. Um, so one option is to move from a silicon iron to a cobalt iron. So that, that gives us a direct increase of about 30% in terms of um, magnetic field saturation capability. So that translates directly into a 30% torque increase. So that enabled us to make the, the, the machine slightly smaller for a given torque. Um, then is the, the windings on the rotor themselves. So you noticed in the one of the, in the I think it was the Audi uh, pictures, we've got a significant uh, axial length that, that's taken up by the end windings from having to uh, insert those in, into the stator. So in, in this case, we're uh, winding individual stator elements and then getting rid of the uh, some of the requirement for the um, uh, end windings in terms of, of axial length. Um, the rotor, uh, if, if you go for an integrated permanent magnet motor, you've got a very significant volume of uh, electrical steel required, which adds mass, which adds package volume. Uh, so we've got a permanent magnet solution allowing us to uh, take as much mass and volume out of the rotor as possible. Um, and then, then at the end of the day, we still require this uh, to get significant range out of the battery, which is just one of the uh, qualifications of usability. It's something directly for the customer end, and we don't want the heat to deal with and can degrade the oil or can lead us to degrade the performance and, and give ultimately give less to the customer. Uh, so we, we had a number of different uh, options for how we deal with the oil and the transmission that, that we used to uh, optimize our, our, our losses and heat generation okay anything else you want to add no not, on, not for this thank you so we can talk a little bit some about the ev trend we have so one things really everyone talk about is a semiconductor crisis how do you believe it affects maybe some of the choices are made or I don't know, um, is that making, an, I'm, I'm sure it's making an impact, right? It, it, it definitely is. So we've got um, significant challenges on semiconductors and, and for uh, both switching devices and controls. 
and, and this is every bit as, as serious as it sounds. There's uh, stories of um, semiconductor suppliers with talking to our tier ones where they've got a letter threatening them from the White House on. And where, you know, um, where are you using the most of this semiconductor? Is that everywhere or just the inverter? Or uh, it, it's literally, literally everywhere. So on the, on the motor, it's, it's in the inverter. Um, it's, it's the control device and the switch device, but it dotted around the car. Anything, anything with any logic and control uh, is, is unfortunately at, at risk of um, susceptibility to the semiconductor challenges. And do you believe it will push any production of the car? Or I don't know if you can comment about that. So at the, at the moment, we're finding solutions. And um, fortunately, being part of a, a significantly sized global uh, automotive uh, family, uh, there, there's teams who are on hand to help us uh, find sources of semiconductors. And, and, and uh, we can uh, remind to the audience that, of course, Lotus belong to Jelly Group, and Jelly is a very huge uh, group, so it helps, of course. Absolutely. But we, we, we still have had some delays from, from availability of certain parts, and there are some very specific parts to, to Evaya that um, have, have held up testing. Um, one big trend is about the high voltage. So in the introduction, of course, we have seen that the voltage changed the curve. So is that now something you will go only for very high voltage? And it is a main trend, I guess, and it's for you an advantage, right? Uh, absolutely. So uh, voltage gives us, us flex design flexibility. Uh, currently, we're looking at um, nominally 800 volt systems, but in practice, this is limited by the charging infrastructure, which is around 910 volts as, as, as an upper, upper limit. Um, so our, our, our battery architectures are looking at um, a fully charged state around 900 volts. Um, however, as we as we move forwards, we're starting to see extra power conversion capabilities built into uh, more higher volume functions, which, which higher volume. Uh, restrictions like this. OK. Um, what about um, the cost of the material? Because we have seen that um, all the costs are going to the roof, nickel are going to the roof, lithium are going to the roof. Oh, Matt, you disappeared. I think we have lost Matt. <laughs> oh, God. OK. Um, well, I don't know what to say. I guess he has lost the connection. Um, so we have, I guess, some, some question already. I hope he can, uh, Matt can join again. But uh, maybe we can. Ah, Matt is here. Okay. Ah, he's, back. he's back with us. Back with yeah. Us. So, so just, for the moment. <laughs> Matthew, back. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So, uh, uh, voltage, more is better. Flexibility is coming. Uh, we're sticking at 900 for a little while. Um, so, is that an advantage for the cost of the choices you have made, of course, for the electric motor? I mean, you have not so much nickel or things like that. So, maybe it's an advantage for you compared to your competitor. I mean. Uh, as we as we move forward away from um, the cobalt iron based solutions uh, into more high volume products, higher voltage gives us a, a cost opportunity because we can increase the power density of the motor, we can increase efficiency, we can uh, make various parts of the system smaller, which which all contribute to reduced cost. Uh, anything you want to add about the EV trends? Um, I don't know if you want to talk about uh, the silicon carbide that can become more mainstream or maybe other technology you believe that are going to become yeah, mainstream so the OEM. So there's, there's a few things. Um, so, so silicon carbide becoming more mainstream will, will uh, is happening. Um, I think beyond that, gallium nitride is is, uh, is, is interesting, uh, especially when you start looking at the costs and, and from sort of 2028, we can see gallium nitride potentially uh, as, a, as a drive solution being even cheaper than silicon. Um, so it, it, it's more capable, we can make it smaller, we can switch harder, we can reduce losses and it's cheaper. Oh, this, this sounds brilliant. Um, um. I have heard that because of the switching, it may also create some problem for uh, electric magnetic field protection. Is that something yes. you are doing? 
Yeah. So it will it will be it'll switch harder. Um, the, the the one of the bigger challenges of switching harder is the field. What is the windings in the um, motor itself? So we can contribute to um, breakdown of the enamel on the motor windings. But um, yeah, this is the fun of engineering. Uh, let's do something that it makes an improvement, and and work out what we need to do to realise it. So is that new enamels? Is it thicker? Do we change the materials? Do we manage it different thermally? Uh, the excitement of engineering of EVs. Okay. So, so yes, gall gallium nitride is one, one of the things. And then uh, focus on efficiency. Um, from, from the Lotus side, if efficiency is fantastic because it enables a, uh, a better system level uh, solution. So we can, we can start using the drive units to take mass out of the batteries. And batteries are horrendously expensive and heavy, whichever way you look at it. So from from a uh, product point of view, so we're, we're using the motor and efficiency to deliver more to the customer um, and, and reduce the cost and mass. Thank you. So I think it's now time for some question from the audience. So I think uh, Tom has maybe some few things to say. So see. Yeah, Tom, you're on mute. disaster the phrase of 2020 or like <laughs> 2022 now um yeah so we, we had a couple of questions in the run-up to the event so i think we'll start off with uh, with one of those um which is from paul donaldson which is lotus have in my estimation always traded on excellent power to rate ratio for their sports cars as batteries are heavy lumps how did that determine your design thinking for your ev okay um so I think I'll refer back to previous comments on the opportunities. So uh, for me, Lotus has always, yes, power to eight has been part of it, but it, it's also uh, a set of engineering principles and, and delivering the right answer uh, and having a customer level uh, solution in mind at all, at all times. So um, it gives us the opportunity to look at how, how we deliver that power, how we engineer a battery solution that's perhaps not as offensively heavy as, as, it, as it could be and, and the general um, appreciation appears to be uh, and what, what motors uh, innovations and, and technology can we use to make an overall uh, better system that, that's perhaps not as heavy and we're, we're currently looking at getting to the place where we can deliver a sensible EV powertrain with um, perhaps slightly better than combustion engine performance for a, a similar a similar mass and personally I want to make it lighter. If we, if we look at electric missions, we can get a hell of a lot out of them. It might might be a good point, actually. I think we've got a slide on this, haven't we? We could um, we could just do a bit of exploration on. <clears throat> uh, so maybe we can talk about the opportunities as as you move away from something like the Avaya, which is obviously a very low volume, quite specialist application, and towards higher volume. Where where might you go in terms of making something that works for that that different yeah. customer? So th this slide was really about exploring how we might move and, and develop a, a higher volume, lower cost point solution. Um, so 350 kilowatt is roughly what we've got on a corner of an Evira, and then that's a pretty sensible uh, power target for, for an EV sports car. So if we look at Evira, um, the core technology of the transmission, uh, that, that's uh, in effectively in mass mass production at a sensible cost point and capability it's pretty mature so we can set ourselves a mass target from that um, the inverter uh, the, the all the roadmaps around semiconductors or the options for integration they're, they're getting better so actually I've left the target of it's the same as the uh, if I unit there um, but what what, what do we do for a motor? So if we look at what's on the market now, around four kilowatts per kilo for an electric motor, that, that's a big lump in terms of a electric machine. So if I push that all the way out to people I can see pushing the frontiers um, and look at the technology within a uh, 35 kilowatt per kilo machine, uh, there's a number of items that we what well, the, the 35 kilowatt per kilo solution would be very hard to make and quite expensive um, but if we look at the key technologies and the manufacturing methodologies that achieve it uh, and work that back we, we can see a pretty well in fact a very achievable uh, target uh, that, that relate that gives us a 22 kilogram uh, motor at about 350 kilowatts so overall we can generate ourselves a system target of about 50 kilos for a um, 
for a 350 kilowatt machine uh, that can that can be manufactured easily in high volumes. Um, so then, do we do we push on from there? Um, Pushing on in terms of power density, I think adds costs. So if we push it all the way out to the 35 kilowatts per kilo, we've added cost, and, and in all likelihood we've reduced efficiency because we've used things like cobalt, which has got higher hysteresis losses, or we've changed the windings, or we're going at higher speeds, so we've got expensive and lossy bearings and losses in the uh, in the rotors. So actually, we'd, we'd likely need a bigger battery, and we've offset all of the uh, benefit uh, that we've added through having a higher density. A high power density drive unit. Um, so actually, as we want to move forward from a sensible uh, mass target for a drive unit, we need, really need to focus on efficiency to deliver um, less losses, less heat to deal with, uh, less demand on the battery um, in terms of peak power, but also uh, less requirement for energy and range. Yeah. So. There was, there was another question yeah. actually around efficiencies, which, which came in earlier, which I, I think we've kind of touched on already, but maybe just to reinforce the point, I guess. Um, so it was around, is there a difference between inefficiency between a low power and a high power EV engine or EV motor? Um, will a 500 horsepower system use the same power in normal driving or normal road loads as a 200 horsepower? Uh, and I guess it's just yeah. it's about the, the operating efficiency residency points that... Um, so absolutely that there is a difference um, and if we just look at some of the uh, design choices on the road you'll see people with disconnects so effectively a 500 horsepower motor to two, 250 horsepower ones uh, and we can see people choosing to disconnect the motors and not have those losses um, when, when driving and then just on terms of machine size itself uh, if you've got um, more electrical steel with a magnetic field switching through it you've got more losses if you've got more windings and more current uh, to, to cope with the um, really high power demands all, all, all of that has, has losses in there if you've got bigger bearings again losses uh, if you've got uh, if you've done some Thing to. Oh, I think I may have lost Matt Pumping again. I'm calling oh. over it. <laughs> You're back, Matt. You're back. Oh. <laughs> You're on mute, Cecile. I don't believe we are going to get connected car at some point because we still cannot make something stable. Matt's back. Here we are. Hi, Matt. If you're doing anything that uses energy to assist your cooling and thermal management, uh, a, a bigger electric machine is going to have more losses there as well. So things like uh, oil spray for end windings or any windage losses there. So it's a, it's a shame we're being interrupted by the internet, isn't it? But some, well, it's, it's people really... calling me. And, um... Oh, you're on the telly. Is it one of those kind of things? Um so uh, we, we did have some questions around gallium nitride. I think we've mostly covered those, but thanks for those questions. Um, there's a specific one then around 95% um, efficiency. So where those figures come from, whether it's empirical road data, road test data, or, or from dynos. What, which part of the presentation was the 95% on? So I think this uh, will be relating to motor efficiency chart that we were discussing. Okay, so uh, mo motor efficiency, uh, that would, that, that, that. so ni 95 as an average motor efficiency is, is pretty good um, uh, for, a, for a WLTC cycle. Have we got it in here? Okay, no. So in in motors and systems, you'll 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 see ninety eight percent for motors, ninety nine maybe in some uh, system efficiencies. In some research activities, you'll see an average WLTP for something really really good of ninety seven percent average for a drive unit. Um, so that there's there's a number of different places you could you could put ninety five percent in sensible modern. Um, yeah, pretty highly efficient systems yeah. overall. This is back to the joys of EV. Yeah. We're, we're not talking 30% thermal efficiency anymore. No. <laughs> yeah. Quite serious. Uh, so there was one more which I've now lost. Apologies. EV efficiency. And we have covered. 
Uh, we, I think we've covered most of these. Um, maybe just reinforce the point regarding gallium nitride versus silicon carbide. Um, whether from an EMC perspective, there's a, a preference. <laughs> Depend, depends which side of EMC you're looking at. If you're, if you're uh, it's fun to have a challenge. So if you've got GAN, you're switching fast, you've potentially got transient voltages, which are um, more of a challenge to deal with. Um, but equally, if you don't like it, the uh, mass cost uh, volume uh, challenges of, of the link cap or the magnetic system that, that required to filter it, if you can switch faster or uh, use a smaller magnetic system to provide the same, to provide the right level of filtering, um, th there's opportunities there as well from an EMC point of view because you can make your management system smaller. So it's really it's really a new challenge, and in terms of um, the the actual management of, of gate driving itself with with SIC as we as with GAN, sorry, as we looked and um, put the uh, gate driver function onto the onto the uh, semiconductor wafer itself and, and achieve a cost through integration, a cost reduction through integration and functional integration. Um, it's a nice new challenge there as well. More engineering exploration to be done. Um, okay, I think uh, we'll, we'll probably bring it to a, a close there so we, we don't want to run these sessions too long to, to maintain interest. Um, so I just wanted to say, firstly, thanks to Matt uh, for joining us, spending uh, spending some of your time with us. Thank you again to Cecile uh, for helping to organise these. And, and thanks to everybody who's dialed in online. Um, hopefully these sessions are useful. We're going to continue to run them every couple of weeks. Um, and all of these sessions will be available via the YouTube channel. The first episode that we recorded two weeks ago is now live. Uh, and this one will be up fairly shortly as well. Uh, so thank you very much from me. And thank, thank you for having me. In the electric I was so weak before. Thanks a lot, uh, Matt, because in battery I'm okay, but in electric motor I'm not so okay. So well, happy to answer any questions. And then thank thank you very much for having me. And thank you very much for the interesting questions. And you still can submit questions on uh, the LinkedIn comments, uh, and we still can try to answer some of them later. Thanks a lot, and see you in two weeks' time. Uh, don't forget to say that um, in two weeks we should be live again. Yes, our, our next session will be focusing on uh, high voltage batteries. So we'll, we'll see you all then, hopefully. I'll send some questions. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.